Floods and landslides continue to plague parts of China. To make the situation worse, authorities are discharging water from local reservoirs with little to no warning ahead of time. A newly built house is torn down in China. Police reportedly beat up the owner, who's disabled, and his elderly parents. Some overseas Chinese people are running scams on dating websites. The consequence? Chinese authorities are destroying their homes to force them to return to China. Controversial Chinese tech giant Huawei is hiring a former BBC News executive. That's to help it brush up its international image. And a blow to China's nuclear ambitions. The U.S. blocks China's largest nuclear company from sourcing crucial materials from the U.S. Welcome to China In Focus. I'm Tiffany Meyer. Before we start with our daily news, we have a short announcement. We have our premiere at 9.30 p.m. Eastern Time from Monday to Saturday on our YouTube channel and also on TV. NTD is available on many platforms, including cable TV, satellite and over-the-air TV across the U.S. And it continues to grow. Please check out ntd.com slash TV. Type in your zip code to find all the ways you can watch our show. That's ntd.com slash TV. Floods continue to plague many parts of China. In Shenxi province, villages are flooded and buildings and bridges have collapsed. Water levels in China's second largest river are also substantially higher. And authorities ordered to discharge water from reservoirs are making the situation worse. NTD's Don Ma has more. No end in sight for floods in China. Heavy rains in Shanxi province are causing reservoirs to overflow and some already discharged water. Continuing rainfall has also led to landslides and the collapse of river embankments. The ensuing water flooded villages, causing damage to buildings and bridges. In one county, floodwaters washed away a section of a railroad supporting structure, forcing the train to stop in its tracks. In another county, a section of wall of a residential building collapsed. Cars parked in front of the building were buried. Footage shows some city streets in the province closed off due to flooding. At the same time, water levels in China's second longest river, the Yellow River, which also passes through Shaanxi province, is seeing a dramatic rise. There is an obvious increase in water level. Before, the distance from the shore to the bottom was 7 to 8 meters. But look at it now. There is only around a 1 meter distance. The water level has risen 5 to 6 meters. Meanwhile, in parts of China's Sichuan province, flood water levels are reaching startling heights. Tall trees are half submerged in flood water. And in Xiaxi and Gansu province, severe landslides are gripping parts of the province. Online video shows residential buildings toppling over and cars being buried by debris. The landslides have caused substantial damage. Many residential buildings in Gansu have collapsed as a result. Don Ma. NTD News. Chinese authorities forcibly demolished a newly built house. They also beat the owner, who is disabled, and his elderly parents. They claim the house is illegal, though the owner had the required legal documents in hand. A new house would have been home to three generations of a traditional Chinese family in a village in central China's Anyang City. But before the dust had settled, the house was demolished by the authorities. At the end of September, the house's owner, Jia Gunda, received a notice warning that his house would be demolished the same day. Jia told us more than 100 people came to his house. They didn't show any proof of identity or legal documents, and they didn't allow Jia to move anything out of the house before they started demolishing it. Jia has a disabled hand. His parents are over 60. All three were beaten and detained for hours. There were special police and riot police. They held shields. One of them grabbed my father's neck and shoved him to the ground. My mother had bruises on her arms. After beating me and my family, they locked us up in the village committee for a total of six hours. My crop harvest and home appliances were all smashed inside. Until now, Jia's father is still in the hospital and his mother is being taken care of by Jia's sister. Authorities said this house violates the law, but Jia didn't agree. My house was not built on arable land, but on idle land in the village. The village committee agreed to the build. I have the written notice with their stamp. After it was built, they said it was illegal. But before I built it, no one said it was illegal. Almost half of the money for the new house was borrowed from relatives. Jia said he cannot afford another house like this again. 
Chinese Communist Party leader Xi Jinping is reportedly trying to crack down on overseas Chinese con men. These con men are using dating apps to deceive people looking for a relationship and scan them into making investments. There are tens of thousands of these kind of scammers. It seems Xi Jinping is not happy about this sort of thing, and he is employing draconian measures to bring an end to it. Police stations are asking these scammers to return to China. They are threatening to demolish their homes in China if they don't come back, and have even threatened their relatives' homes. What's more, their children would be prohibited from going to school. And it seems these tough measures may be working. More than 50,000 scammers have returned to China this year. In China, some police officers have been accused of using their power for personal profit. And now an internal document from the Chinese Communist Party reveals some of their means. The Epoch Times recently obtained an internal document from central China's Ningling County, Hunan province. It appears to show a range of methods police officers use to make ethically gray income in hidden ways. It's common practice for traffic officers to randomly issue tickets to passing vehicles but there are far more ways to make money illegally. The document from the Ningling County Police Department lists three, operating businesses, joining financial firms' shares to lend money with high interest, and profiting from businesses run by their family. Former Chinese police officer Dan Guangping says that in the past, police officers ran businesses openly. Now they do it in secret. At the beginning of the reform and opening up policy, police officers did it openly. They operated restaurants and companies directly doing business and running shops. It was all open. Later, a policy, an internal document, was issued ordering that the military, the police and government officials shouldn't run businesses. Those who used to do business in the past all do them secretly. Dong said that later, many police officers transferred their restaurants or companies to their family. And police officers are using their power to coerce people to go to their restaurants or have them do business with their companies. This report points to serious police corruption. During the regime's August political campaign, it claimed to have penalized nearly 200,000 police officers, but only 1.1 percent of them were charged. The other 99 percent were subject to minor penalties, such as warning or suspension from duties. Dong says he believes the CCP's internal campaign won't work. The corruption has been dealt with several times. It didn't work. The Chinese Communist Party is a malignant tumor. The corrupt officers cannot be removed at all. Dong says the incoming officers are just as corrupt as the outgoing officers. Chinese tech giant Huawei has hired a former BBC executive as its editor-in-chief. The U.S. has banned the controversial producer of telecom equipment over national security concerns and the company's ties to the Chinese military. Now editor-in-chief Gavin Allen was previously in charge of some of the most influential news programs in the U.K. and part of the upper management of British state media, the BBC. Allen announced his new position on LinkedIn, writing in a post that he was hugely proud to be joining a company that was a creative force for good. Huawei has been ramping up efforts to hire foreign talent. This as it's been facing U.S. pressure and suspicion from other countries. Some worry that if Huawei builds their 5G infrastructure, it might allow the Chinese regime to spy on them. Last time Huawei's recruiting made international headlines, it hired a renowned French mathematician to work at its research center in Paris. A recently published report by a French military think tank accuses the company of trying to influence Western politics by sponsoring political parties and hiring well-connected foreign officials. The U.S. is banning a Chinese company from getting crucial radioactive fuel. That's amid concerns over Beijing's growing military ambitions. NTD's Juliet Song has more. China's largest nuclear company won't be able to get certain nuclear materials from the U.S. anymore. This after a suspension order from America's nuclear power regulator. The move comes amid Beijing's increasing nuclear ambitions. The Chinese regime is ramping up its production of nuclear weapons. And Charles Richard, the man overseeing America's nuclear forces, has given lawmakers a serious warning about that. They are well ahead of the pace to double their stockpile by the end of the decade. And I further submit that the size of a nation's weapons stockpile by itself is a very crude measure of what they can do with that capability. As Beijing is on its way to increasing its nuclear warheads, the U.S. is decreasing its stockpile. 
the current number stands at over 3,700. That's down from over 3,800 a year earlier. And the new U.S. ban is targeting China's CGN. This company is the world's third largest nuclear power company and China's biggest nuclear company. And the materials that the U.S. has banned CGN from getting are necessary for nuclear weapons production, including radioactive materials and deuterium. China's nuclear power plants need them to operate, and these plants produce material necessary to make nuclear weapons. The new ban is an extension from a Trump-era order. In 2020, the Trump administration barred CGN from getting American civil nuclear technology. The order says the concern is Beijing uses the expertise of its private companies to modernize its military, therefore posing a threat to America's national security. Juliet Song, NTD News. The U.S. Navy will release new strategic guidance later this week, and the head of the Navy says one of their top priorities is China. Navy Secretary Carlos del Toro says the first priority in the guidance is to maintain America's maritime dominance. And he says China is top of the Pentagon's watch list. Del Toro also notes Beijing's rapid military buildup. He says from cyber capabilities to anti-satellite missiles, Beijing is advancing in every domain. And that its expanding military capability is threatening America's ability to operate in the waters near the first island chain. The first island chain is a swath of islands that stretches from Japan to Malaysia. These islands are critical for America's safety as they deter China from launching submarine-based nuclear attacks toward the U.S. Right now, China has the world's largest fleet of Navy ships, 350, while America only has about 300 ships. Del Toro says he'd like to work towards a 350-ship Navy. He says the number of ships aren't as important, though, and what really matters is whether the U.S. can modernize and invest in the new military technology. Toro says another priority is to work with friends and allies, as they are also under threat from Beijing. He notes it's crucial for the Navy to work with nations, including Australia and India, and provide arms for Taiwan so it can defend itself. Hong Kong's strict quarantine rules are causing European companies to consider moving their employees out of the city. Hong Kong is partly carrying out its so-called COVID-0 strategy from mainland China. European Chamber of Commerce Chairman Frederick Golob told Bloomberg on Wednesday that most boardrooms across Europe and Hong Kong are discussing relocating some of their staff. The chamber represents countries including France, Germany and Spain. In August, it issued an open letter warning that the strict pandemic measures threatened Hong Kong's standing as a global finance hub. Hong Kong's head, Carrie Lam, said on Tuesday that Hong Kong valued its connection to mainland China more than its international business and global travel connections. Golub's comments were a response to her remarks. Hong Kong requires returning residents to be quarantined in hotels for up to three weeks, even if they are fully vaccinated. Another factor that contributes to Hong Kong's shrinking population is the Chinese regime imposing the national security law. Golub says they do see the tendency to restructure either parts of entire companies to other locations in Asia. A survey by the American Chamber of Commerce in Hong Kong also found earlier this year that over 40 percent of its members were considering moving out of the city. Taiwan's president says they will ensure regional peace and stability. She told French and Australian guests on Thursday that the self-ruled island wants to work with other like-minded democracies. That's days after a dramatic spike in tensions with China. Olivia Chan reports. Taiwan's president Tsai Ing-wen told senior French and Australian dignitaries on Thursday that the island seeks to work with other like-minded democracies and will ensure regional peace. The trips by four French senators and former Australian Prime Minister Tony Abbott come after four straight days of mass Chinese Air Force incursions into Taiwan's air defense zone. The French senators met with Tsai at the presidential palace, despite strong objections from China, which is always angered by visits of foreign officials. Tsai said Taiwan was very moved that the French senators decided to come, despite what she described as pressure, a reference to China. I want to take this opportunity to thank France for paying attention to the importance of the Taiwan Straits in the international arena and supporting Taiwan's international participation. Tsai gave a similar message in later remarks to Ebert, who told her he was in Taiwan to help end its international isolation 
praising its democracy and handling of the global health crisis. Not everyone and not everywhere is pleased at Taiwan's progress. And I do note that Taiwan is challenged on an almost daily basis by its giant neighbour. Tsai did not directly mention the recent Chinese Air Force activities in public comments at her meetings with the senators or with Abbott. Neither France nor Australia have formal diplomatic ties with Taiwan, like most countries. But the island has sought support from them both, as well as the US and its other allies. China claims Taiwan as its own territory and has been exerting growing military and political pressure towards Taipei. New Zealand could be sending a strong message to China that the South China Sea is international waters. On Wednesday, the New Zealand Defence Force released a statement saying that its Navy frigate would be transiting through the South China Sea en route to participating in an international military exercise. It says the deployment exercises freedom of navigation and points out that the New Zealand Defence Force has operated in the region for decades, as well as noting that the South China Sea is routinely transited by merchant ships, naval vessels and aircraft. China claims over 90 percent of the South China Sea. That's despite a 2016 international tribunal ruling that those claims are without merit. New Zealand is en route to joining a major exercise involving Australia, the United Kingdom, Singapore and Malaysia. Their statement says the exercises are to strengthen the country's relations. House Democrats want to charge mining companies operating on federal land for the first time ever. They say it's only fair to make them pay. But some say this new tax could hurt the mining industry in the U.S. and force the nation towards more dependence on Russia and China. NTD's Melina Weiskup has more. Senators are criticizing a new mining royalty plan by House Democrats, calling it anti-green and pro-China. It would enforce new fees on mining companies, an 8% gross royalty on existing mines and 4% on new ones, and a 7 cent fee for every ton of rock moved. These hard rock minerals like lithium and copper are what's used to make wind turbines and solar panels. So President Biden's green energy plan increases the demand for mining these minerals while more fees make it harder to do so. If you make it more expensive uh, to mine in the United States, not only are we currently importing more than 90 percent of our metals and minerals, that percentage is going to go even higher. That is just seeking to make us completely reliant on China for our energy infrastructure and energy security. He says China mines approximately eight times as much product as the United States, and China is the largest mining nation in the world. House Democrats pushing for energy reform say we can avoid a dependence on China by developing our own minerals like lithium. We will develop, manufacture, employ business and workers here in America. But in the past, environmentalists have blocked any efforts to do so. Uh, the pebble mine that would have been a prodigious producer of minerals and metals and, and crucial materials, and that got shut down. And that happens time after time after time. They say that they want to push for these energy sources that depend upon metals and, and minerals that must be mined. And then the moment that we do that, they oppose all of it anywhere in the United States. They want us to be totally dependent on China and other nations. Those who support new royalties for mining on federal lands say that mining companies aren't paying their fair share in taxes. Some in the mining business say they're open to new royalties, but the House proposal goes too far. Senators now aiming to find a middle path. I would urge us um, to maybe not take um, quite the zealous approach that the House of Representatives took, but to find a fair and transparent um, way for taxpayers to be um, compensated for, for these minerals. And he's echoed by a few other Democratic senators who do acknowledge that this House proposal would impose billions of dollars in new fees for mining companies, potentially hurting the mining industry. So now senators are working through the details, hoping to find a path forward that won't deal such a heavy blow to the mining industry and our energy security. Reporting in Washington, D.C., Melina Weiskup, NTD News. A group of French senators are ringing the alarm about Beijing's influence on college campuses. They are explaining some of the techniques the Chinese regime uses to infiltrate colleges not only in France, but also in the U.S. NTD's David Vivez has the story. 
A group of French senators concluded in a report on Wednesday that the Chinese regime has a strategy to systematically influence college campuses in France and other countries. In other words, Beijing tries to pressure universities in a way that it becomes impossible for them to challenge the CCP's influence, programs or narratives. The CCP is the most serious threat in terms of influence. It uses illegal methods. One of them has led to college professors censoring themselves. The report came out after the senators did extensive personal research. They had 30 meetings and interviews with college instructors, ambassadors from different countries, and with representatives of French ministries. One of the CCP's method is to pressure colleges to self-censor. When there are partnerships involved, college professors start to self-censor under the pressure of their colleagues or the university. The senators also investigated Confucius Institutes. They say Confucius Institutes are gateways that allow the CCP to enter Western universities and gain more power over a university's program or research. Several French and European colleges have either closed their Confucius Institutes or contained their influence. But Senator André Gatolin says there are new threats. Confucius Institutes are in a weak position. What is happening, though, and it is even more serious, is that the CCP is trying to convince researchers to work for them giving them salaries without telling their universities. The senators also mentioned Beijing's partnerships with private business schools. Uh, Some business school presidents told us that Confucius Institutes want to develop more business programs inside the universities so that they can establish themselves in the local economy. Doing business through college partnerships opens up more than one gateway for the CCP. Confucius Institutes were at the beginning only for students or senior citizens wanting to learn Chinese. Now they try to develop economic programs and have a more business-oriented objective that sometimes goes with the new Belt and Road Initiative. Now there are even institutes of the new Belt and Road. The Senate report says the Chinese regime has a long-term objective to systematically influence foreign universities, and this is especially true for private universities and business schools rather than public universities. And they say this problem is more serious in the United States and the UK rather than in France. David Vives, NTD News. A U.S. attorney is seeking to increase the bail amount for a Chinese student who is charged with setting fires in a historic Alabama church. According to local media, Xiao Chun Yan is being held in detention on a $30,000 bond charged with second-degree arson. The attorney believes the bail is too low, as Yen has strong ties to another country. She is 27 years old and was in the U.S. on a student visa. But with the charge, Yen's visa has been revoked. She was identified in video footage of a historic Baptist church in Montgomery catching fire last week. The motive remains unclear. And that's all for today's China in Focus. Thanks for watching and see you tomorrow.